call the meeting to order. Uh, pledge of allegiance. Yeah. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, roll call for the Okay. Bob Robert Hayes. Here. Jeffrey Rosenthal. Present. Present. Um, Honest. Um, Ron Leslie. Here. Robert Fulton. Here. John Hodgson. Here. Stephanie Rizicki. Here. Richard Carr. Here. Chairman. Yes, uh, we have guests, uh, the two people from Schnabel. I don't know names, but <laughs> uh, welcome. Uh, so I assume, I assume we have, uh, um, oh, a motion to adapt or revise the meeting agenda. Uh, do we have a need to go into executive session or? Okay, so a meeting to, uh, a motion to uh, um, adopt. The uh, meeting agenda. Mr. So, Chair, I would make that motion and ask for. Oh, do we ask, can we do the motion? Oh. Huh? Second or form. Can we do the motion to accept the meeting agenda? No. Okay. Um, hey, the motion's out there. We'll, we'll revisit it when we have mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, in that case, we're all the way down to number seven. Well, and I just wanted to. Uh, Make a motion to revise the agenda to take a, a moment to honor our veterans. There are a number of veterans here, I'm sure. Thank them for their service to our country. Okay. <clears throat> um, in that case, we will move right to number seven, the presentation. Gentlemen, welcome. Going to be right? does this, sir, does this mirror the handout? Okay, so we can follow in the handout just as easily. Thank you. I already have two bulging discs, that's why I asked. Well, no, you can stand, just stand to the left, just over here. Yes, thank you. Good morning, my name is Mike Taylor. I'm here with my colleague, Greg Aguero. We're both from Shovel Engineering, our office is in Clifton Park, New York. And um, we're supporting the Hudson River, Black River, Freeway District on the Conkingville Dam, and particularly the Stoy Foundation for Mediation and Concrete Repair Project. Uh, what I wanted to do briefly here, uh, first, thank you to the board for having us here today. Uh, much appreciated. And we wanted to use this uh, presentation to do two simple things. Uh, just do a quick recap to refresh your memory as to the basis for the project and to give you an update on our progress through the series of tasks that we've been working on. Any questions before we get underway? Robert, any? So, uh, when the project was conceived and uh, established as a contract and uh, put into play at Chernobyl, uh, we had a series of objectives uh, to focus on a repair of the spillway. And, and while we had some thoughts about the conditions and the seepage that were observed and the deteriorated concrete and so on, uh, we had some initial thoughts early on, and I do believe it's still all true, towards uh, grouting and, and rehabilitation of the concrete. Uh, when I say grouting, that's to uh, work within the spillway, uh, almost below the surface and in the bedrock itself. But the overall objectives or goals uh, improve site safety, reduce seepage and weathering. Uh, Extend the service life of the dam, restore function, aesthetics, and uh, compliance with both uh, FERC and DEC. And any of the work that has already been done, uh, we need to reduce the cost of muster as well as the regulatory activities. The project zones, uh, if you can visualize yourself flying above the uh, site, you can see the uh, right kind of thing. Middle there on the left is the uh, bridge, and uh, we've got 
various features, which I'm sure you all, you all know, but on the far right side uh, is where the EJ West powerhouse is. We don't show the powerhouse itself, but the bulkhead face is there, and that's what we refer to as zone A. Um, the rock slope is that, we get my color blindness, I think that's brown, uh, zone seven, and um, one of the other main features of the project, of course, is the spillway channel, uh, which is zone five, and that runs up um, underneath the bridge from the lake and over to the EJ West, and also to the uh, And of course, the most important is the spillway in the last place. What we did was we broke the, uh, I'll say the features up into an east and a west project area, and our current area of focus is in the east, so we're primarily only looking at zones five through eight. And in a kind of table format, just to put the project into perspective where we refer to east and west, we're in, in phase E1, so the eastern project area and the first component in that project area is site exploration <coughs> and conceptual design and development, conceptual design. Time frame for that was from commencement in April 2017 and working towards the end date of September, fall 2015. And please feel free if there's any questions along the way, just, just jump in. Okay. So, what's a weird? It's weird. It's a spillway feature uh, that controls the water surface elevation uh, when water surfaces up to the crest of the, of the top of the dam basically it flows above that. It can't be discharged through EJ West or the gatehouse. Discharge over the weir down the rock slope. Pictures are going to be pictures of thousand more. The weir is on the left there. Oh. Uh, which is the concrete surface and Very just cool. to the uh, Next to the weir is the water surface of the spillway channel. Um, that spillway channel feeds both the uh, gatehouse in the background and then the valve system there, as well as EJ West, uh, which is the uh, power plant behind. So oh, this is a weir. <coughs> <coughs> and I always refer to it as the spillway. Spillway. Just the spillway. Interesting uh, and wonderful documentation on this project. This is actually a rare project. There's many projects we work on that don't have a lot of information about the history and the construction. Uh, there's a remarkable body of information, and, uh, particularly photographs. Uh, right there is a photograph taken from, I want to say, about 1928, 29, and uh, it shows someone as if they're standing in the channel itself, and the water surface that you see on the left is much higher up, so you're down at the bottom of the channel. And, uh, they actually drilled and blasted and excavated the rock out of the hillside to create that channel um, so as to feed both the gatehouse and the uh, EJ West Tower. Another kind of overview of the spillway weir. On the left is with the water surface at a higher elevation, and on the right, a fairly uh, lower elevation, and Robert. Uh, the regulating district's mission is to, uh, if you were to say it in the uh, order five, flood protection and augmentation. And that the surface elevation goes up and down uh, <coughs> in response to those activities. Of course, the inflow and now. Kind of an overview of the project. This is standing on the earth embankment dam looking back towards the gatehouse on the left, the spillway, which you can see the kind of seamless concrete feature there, the weir, and in the background on the right, upper right, <coughs> the powerhouse, and then and most prominently you can see the rock slope below the concrete spillway weir. This is a shot of the bulkhead gate structure on the face of the GA West powerhouse where water intake occurs. And on the right is Early uh, completion of construction uh, before the channel was closed in, and on the left, the somewhat current conditions where you can see quite a bit of uh, that white staining, efflorescence, and, and deterioration of concrete, and so on. Uh, just to put it in perspective, if you look on the right, you see those uh, kind of vertical uh, columns or guides for the gates there, and you can see the top of them. And if you then look to the left, they're lower down, and it just kind of gives you two different perspectives of that bulkhead. 
So that thing moves up and down. Within those guides, there's a series of gates. They've since been remo removed, <coughs> permanently removed. Um, there's a <coughs> second set of gates inside um, the <coughs> Brookfield Power side of the property. Okay. <coughs> and uh, those control the flow for the Tyco plant. And so the district, 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 did, not, did, yeah, the okay. district no longer needed to maintain or keep those structures, so they've been pulled out. And if you recall from the uh, <coughs> real quick, that uh, phase to the bless you, bless you. phase to the uh, power house zone A is that ten strike there, which is a ten strike. That's the portion that's. Uh, those are those. Is that where those gates that Correct. we're seeing in that? Yeah, you're up in the air now. Okay. Down towards it, and that, and <coughs> the gates were right on the most obscure. <coughs> so, um, the work uh, within phase E1 and our scope of work, uh, standing at two year period. <coughs> Two and a half years. Um, series of tasks ranging, and you, I think you've all seen these before, but to recap uh, project management, uh, document and information review, and uh, some visual inspections, and developing a site exploration plan to drill through the spillway and into the bedrock and the support structures. <coughs> Task four is the exploration program itself. And then Obtaining and managing data, and that's the ongoing task. Task one through three are largely complete. Task four is well underway, and I'll show you some more information on that. And then once we complete the uh, work in task four, the field work will be working through that data that's obtained and doing other analyses and making evaluations. <coughs> From that information, then in our understanding of what the data is telling us, and seeing, uh, we will look to identify what we think are uh, conditions that are good, conditions that are not so good, uh, identify a series of concepts uh, or alternatives for addressing the condition conditions or deteriorating conditions, and that's the conceptual design process tests. So, uh, with regard to task four and then kind of the status of the work, uh, that we're well into now. <coughs> we've done physical surveys. Uh, we've done a series of uh, LIDAR and, and drone scans of uh, kind of digital scanning of the above water surface areas. Uh, we've used uh, some geophysical and other technologies to do below water scans and, and used a series of things, both a survey vessel that tows antenna arrays and also a robotic uh, smaller boat that uh, tows arrays and that allows us to look below the surface and get into the conditions below the surface. Drone seems kind of obvious. Big drone in the sky with a GoPro looking down at it. Right. What's the light on? It's a... Uh, it's for a, a light. It's an infrared <laughs> stick, uh, technology that uh, is uh, so basically what is that? The surface of the earth uh, survey uh, methodology that we can use and it can provide very high resolution information, almost like in stereo, where if you think of kind of an original survey where there's a guy on the ground with a survey station and you know, get a couple of spot elevations and things like that. Well, that's good information at that point, and the camera tells you a nice story and pictures, but it's not intelligent information. LIDAR is a process that allows you to get the topographic sur surface of the survey uh, with digital information. So it's basically uh, intelligent information that can be used to make these calculations. AKA great engineering toys. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and very efficient, too. Uh, you can do more in a quick survey than uh, 50 surveyors uh, took two years to do previously. Wow. Okay. High resolution. <coughs> 
and showing you some pictures of that. This is kind okay. of neat, actually. Cool. Uh, so in a similar way, um, we've done scanning below the water surface, uh, the uh, channel and, and the channel walls and things like that. Uh, we've been doing geologic and rock mapping, and we've been we, we mentioning the rock slope and the prominent feature that the spill was sitting on, and also the other side of the channel, you can see the, the mountain rising up there, and the geology plays a very, very important role in this project, not only in forming the channel, but it's also the foundation on which the spill was sits. So, and within that, uh, geophysical mapping, uh, we, uh, not only are we drilling through the spillway and down into the rock, but we're doing more inside the ball holes. It's very interesting information and, and information that is also digital and allows us to look at things spatially with uh, regard to the integrity of the crashes. Ongoing explorations, uh, we're out there now with the drill rig and the pouring apparatus. Uh, we're primarily working from the crest of the spillway, drilling vertical holes down through the concrete into the bedrock. We're also doing some horizontal, shorter concrete cores into the spillway from a couple of different locations. And uh, process as early as this week or next, uh, we'll be doing some cores in the upstream phase of the bulkhead of the GMS powerhouse. Again, to obtain samples of the concrete <coughs> for uh, subsequent laboratory testing and to uh, evaluate the integrity of it. Whether it's in shape or whether it's deteriorated, but information, physical samples. Um, so. I guess just let me clarify in future land testing we develop the contract document and uh, doing the engineering oversight of their uh, the hard labor. So uh, the regulating district is entering into a contract <coughs> with the, the testing labs and they're working under a series of uh, plans and specifications to do this chunk of work here. <coughs> so, rock mapping. This is the rock slope just below the spillway. If you look to the very top of the left photo, you can see the concrete, the kind of the bottom edge of the spillway there, sitting on top of the rock. But you've got this prominent rock slope that supports the spillway, but is also, uh, in essence, part of the spillway in the sense that in order to go to the spillway, it goes down the rock face. And um, we can see a lot of the rock face here, but it's also, over the years, uh, some of the rock has come out and there's been various uh, uh, repair and activities to plaster concrete in. I, I call it bento concrete to fill in cavities that have opened up uh, other areas of that shot creek to kind of uh, give a more smooth surface and then prevent some of the material from getting plucked out during high spillway discharges. Um, but that rock slope is, is a very important part of the project in the sense of water going over the spillway. So we had uh, part of our team, these are guys that are specially trained to do this kind of work, um, and we literally scaled up and down the face of the rock on a series of stations, well, 10, 10 foot holes and 50 foot key stations, and uh, obtained information from top of the slope to bottom of the slope, and recorded the rock structure and data in, in the world of rock or rock mechanics, rock engineering, um, the orientation of the joint sets and the fractures and how weathered they are, are they open, do they have infill, uh, are they seeping, <coughs> the pieces of the rock are mapped in that circle there that you see, uh, you can visualize the compass and you can see the north and south, west and east markers there. Um, it's kind of like looking into a half basketball. And this is the system that's used to uh, statistically capture and, and present the occurrence of these joints of fracture patterns and what you can kind of see that jumps out at you, you can see a concentration of data. There's some scatter here and there with joints of fractures, but there's an overall trend of joints of fracture pattern that exists pretty well through the rock and then that is shown statistically in the colors in the area. And we'll get into more of that, but the ultimately that data is used in other So, uh, some of the above water scanning and then, uh, some of the new technology that is available makes life uh, a lot easier and uh, catches a lot of 
lot of good information. The top left photo, uh, that little circle up top is a circle around a drone that's flying over the project area and the guy in the lower right. Uh, it's kind of a remote control, uh, a radio control operation and it's basically an aerial survey process and it's collecting information visually. On the right is a, an image of uh, what's captured. It looks like a photograph, but it's actually digital information, point cloud information. Uh, down at the bottom, just as an example of some of the power of these tools, on the left is also a point cloud image, not a photograph. Uh, and on the right, we're able to work through the data, and that's an infrared presentation of the water, the seepage that's occurring down the face of the dam <coughs> to see it more clearly uh, than just from the imagery on the left. And uh, it, that shown there with the infrared is a temperature. Uh, so you can even see where the water cascading down the slope remains cold even when it dumps into the lower channel on the left hand side. You can see the, the colder water. I only have a, this is so fascinating. How would you do this in the absence of the modern engineering technology? Visually? Yeah. And, um, you know, if the observations are good, uh, it certainly is, is a telltale, but this allows us to look at it um, not only at a snapshot in time, but you can go back and apply this and look at differences or see them increasing over time or with different water surface elevations. We can actually then start to see how the water surface relates to the seepage. No, the in the old days, um, in the afternoon, yeah. you wouldn't have this at Physical all? Physical surveys and visual observations. And, um, yeah. so and, and actually, it's not that long ago, even going through the body of information that's available uh, in the records, uh, <coughs> some of the uh, reports through FERC and so on, a lot of them are, are visual and not that long ago. So it's, it's such a rapid on <coughs> technology. And to be able to apply it in this way really gives you a, a very good understanding of the condition at a point in time. It allows you to go back and <coughs> change it over time in, in a very succinct way. That's a, maybe a question for you, Rob. Is, is back when the dam was brand new, mm -hmm. was there that kind of seepage? Or do, do we have a record of that kind of seepage? seepage? Or I don't think we have records that indicate that or know if they were monitoring or keeping track of it. I, I suspect there wasn't very much. And, and because at the time the uh, spillway was um, constructed, they also <coughs> had, uh, filled the voids in that rock um, with asphalt material. So, um, <coughs> I think it was pretty itself. pretty well sealed. Yeah. Okay. The channel and itself was lined with a shot creek. And, and, and it was lined. Right. Yeah. You think of a pool, a, you know, a concrete lined pool, Similar to that, although the rock was all jagged, like in that construction photograph, just before they filled it, they were covering the whole surface. Now, to the brother's point, you know, there's no such thing in, in my profession, there's no such thing as watertight anything. And as a function of time, we, and this, uh, you'll see some of the information that we got below the surface shows where some of that shot creek has swallowed off and even where it has fallen off, some of the rocks have fallen out. So there is, you know, over time, there was a kind of loss of that line or a deterioration of that line or that. That's part of where some of the seepage is coming from. And also, uh, the mountainside behind hmm. uh, the spillway there, you know, it, it rises a significant height, and the natural joints and fractures, even those below the spillway, or I should say below the channel, uh, water actually makes its way back up and around. Well, so there was always some base flow. Uh, <coughs> I don't believe So is that ultimately part of the project to actually do repair <coughs> to, to block that seepage? Well, to identify the conditions and, and assess what the means of the project and the function of the project and uh, what types of repairs would be needed to address those conditions if they are of concern. You know, just because there's seepage doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It, right. it, it, if that seepage is, is detrimental to stability or uh, causes further deterioration of the rock slope from free slaw, things like that, then you know you can make not only an assessment of those conditions, but how much things will decay over time, and then what does it mean to integrate with the project?
project. So if it is a problem, then we would identify the <coughs> last task. Here's the conditions, here's what we think that, you know, they mean to the project, and here are some maintenance type repairs that can address those conditions, or here are some more significant repairs uh, that can, you know, from a capital outlet. At some point, you got to replace the brakes on your car. <coughs> you know, it's one thing to maintain them, it's another to replace them. And so there's certain things that are, you know, the replacements or improvements that are still maintenance in a sense. So, so very cool. Plus, there's, uh, Several locations that have wheat pipes sure. that are on there that are dis are built into discharge water. Yeah, drainage is a good yeah. thing in the yeah. so prevention. Mm -hmm. it, it needs to be controlled, yeah. not detrimental. Yeah. Awesome. Drainage is good. There has been some fairly significant portions of that rock foundation over the years, in the last 20 years, that we've been observing it. The due to freeze thaw, the buildup of ice during the winter time mm -hmm. caused sections, large sections, some larger sections, table size sections of rock to peel off or to come become loose enough that when we do spill uh, they can be actually washed <coughs> downstream. So uh, one thing we want to uh, you know, address. <coughs> To Robert's point, if you look at the two lower photographs there, uh, they're the same image, but at the very bottom of the slope and, and right up against the water, you see that mound of material? That's, well, yes, exactly. Those are uh, blocks and, and talus and, and basically material that's walked out of the slope either through the spillway discharge itself or from the free slope and the jacking and the opening up of the rock because the rock is joining and fractured to begin with. It starts to move and migrate, and then when you have a significant release, it kind of cleans the slope off, and then it starts again. So the question then becomes, well, how much reserve do you have? You know, it's kind of like termites eating lumber. You know, at some point, it's losing, losing its, its, its strength, you know, its possession gets thinner and thinner, and potentially undermines the spillway. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. And when we did our rock slope work, we actually tagged the boulders around just so we could get an understanding spatially of where they were occurring most prominently. Obviously, the, the pile at the bottom speaks for itself, but there were other areas on the slope where you could see the boulders. We actually took kind of a count of them uh, because they tell us, you know, simply going back to that stereo, that have, um, those represent joints and fractures, and when they intersect, that's how the rocks can come out, and, and that's part of it. Here's some more uh, we've talked about above and the below water. We did above water before, and then we also use some different technologies to do above and below water uh, scanning within the channel itself. And those are uh, the top right is inside the uh, vessel, the lower right picture is the vessel itself. It's telling the antenna arrays. And there's also, uh, during that work, there were stations or survey equipment set up on a tripod on the spillway and it's basically think of it like uh, a light that's just radiating out. In this case it's, it's digital uh, energy that's going out bouncing <coughs> on the surface and then coming back and being collected. So it, it's a way to uh, capture digitally as a point cloud the conditions. And the top left is kind of an overview you can see uh, the EJ West powerhouse on the far right of that top left photo. See the uh, Route 8 bridge kind of running up and off the page, and uh, that uh, orange color uh, down the middle there is, is within the spillway channel itself and below the water. And we've got some very detailed information. I didn't show it here, but uh, this is the color scheme is correlated to the orange. And then the, the, the bottom left is kind of like a bird's eye view, like you'd see in an MRI. Like that's a particular elevation, or yeah, so uh, uh, like you can layer those up. Bottom, that's actually the bottom of the channel in that color scheme, and you can see some material down at the very bottom of the channel, kind of like look like little islands down there. Mm -hmm. And that's actually some uh, conditions are released some debris that's uh, fallen down and accumulated, and also some of the surface itself 
because it wasn't exactly a perfect surface. So <clears throat> some of the other activities, we did uh, another application of uh, uh, below surface scanning, in this case geophysical mapping of the spillway, the concrete weir, uh, where in the top left you can see uh, what looks like a, a wheelchair or a baby buggy or something, but uh, it's holding the antenna equipment. And at different frequencies, uh, we send energy down into the concrete and then the reflection back up give us images and that bottom image uh, looks funny at first but uh, there's two prominent things you can see there. You can see the number two on the top and then the number four. Mm -hmm. Right about where it's a, right about in between the two and the four you can see kind of a vertical line there mm -hmm. and that's a one of the joints in the concrete itself. Um, but what was important to us was to while we can see certain joints right on the surface now, we wanted to know if the, the some of the overlay work covered other joints that were down there, so that was part of what we were looking for, was to understand uh, both the exposed and, and the buried joints. And those, <coughs> what you see look like a bunch of uh, ripples or humps in the middle there. Uh, that's actually rebar, reinforcement bar, that's in the concrete. And at that particular frequency, it shows up in that form, so it's kind of like a shadow below that. But it, it's a way for us to understand the characteristics of the concrete weathering, reinforcement, and other information. We've got quite a few of these transects. Um, and also something that will tie to the board program. Uh, when you pour this concrete <coughs> on the rock surface, it varies quite a bit. And if you go back to the old drawings, and if you look at the cross section of the spillway, um, you know, it, it's not just this blob of concrete sitting there. Sometimes the rock is dragging and stepped, and the, the surface is irregular. And that's an important part of this project is to understand how thick the concrete is, not just, you know, left and right, but below the surface and how it bonds to the rock itself. Any questions? Um, this is an example of some of the drilling, the vertical and horizontal boring that's done. Uh, top left is the support barge that uh, will float that's being used <coughs> for Compressors and equipment. Uh, the lower left is a uh, portable drill rig that's set up at certain locations on the crest of the spillway, and diamond core drilling is being done down through the concrete and down into the rock, and we've typically been going down uh, 50 feet, which is correlated to the depth of the bottom of the spillway channel. So, on the right is uh, the drill obtaining some horizontal cores from. short cores, but they're supplemental information regarding the integrity of the concrete and the weathering and so on. And those are some of the uh, top left is, is kind of a cross section looking as if you're uh, upstream and looking mm -hmm. forward to TJ West, uh, the blue line is the water surface. <coughs> and then you can see down at the bottom it's kind of trapezoidal shape and formation set in 20 is the floor of the spillway channel. You can see the dash lines and the straight lines, that was from the original drawings where before they excavated the channel, that was the slope of the outside coming down, and then they made excavation through uh, that surface and excavated the channel out. And also, <coughs> just to the right of that trapezoidal channel, uh, you can see where they set the concrete for the spillway here. And that's what it's talking about, the jagged surface there. It's not just this blob sitting there, but it, it marries to the variable surface. Red lines there, the vertical dash line is a representation of the water boring being made down through the concrete and into the bedrock. And the shorter dash red line just to the right of the blue water surface there is, is the horizontal core. So you can kind of visualize that. The, on the left is the vertical boring, and the right is the horizontal core of the, the concrete. And the top right are some of the examples of the concrete cores that have been obtained from the uh, horizontal coring. And the lower image is uh, this box holding the cores from the vertical borings. And two things I wanted to point out, um, if you look at the top right, uh, concrete cores, there's five of them there that were taken along the length of the, at different locations along the spillway. And the one on the far left, you can see the, uh, 
gravel and the aggregate in the concrete. It's kind of a different mix than the rest of them. And at that location, that was uh, some of the more recent, I'll say, the things that they did repair work and they use a finer aggregate. Whereas the concrete cores in the middle, you can see much larger chunks <coughs> of gravel and aggregate. And that was some of the original 1930s concrete that uh, was there. And then on the far right, it's kind of a hybrid of that. It's the older concrete, but uh, that particular location may have been a different concrete mix. And um, on the bottom, uh, there's three rows of, of cores there. The one at the top left, and you can see this at the top there. Uh, that would be the far top left. That's the surface of the spillway. And, then you go down through a uh, kind of finer aggregate. That's the recent uh, 1980s vintage overlay concrete repair work that was done. And then just below that, um, you get into, you can see the larger chunks of concrete and aggregate that are there. And then in the second row, um, starting from left to right, you can see there's still some concrete. And then all of a sudden, just below where that red dash line is in the first section, that's where the concrete is sitting on top of bedrock, and that's where we started coring the rock. So it's a continuous core, and one of the things that was most important to us on this was to understand not only the condition of the concrete, but how that concrete was bonded to the rock. And all the, the top left figure there is a schematic representation of the concrete and its bond to the rock. Um, the reality is, is that that surface might have or not been cleaned, uh, you know, the rock when they originally built it, it was drilled and blasted, it's fractured. So we were very interested in seeing how the bond is between the concrete and the rock. And then below that, uh, you can see, well, right in the middle of uh, that bond, you can see it's pretty kind of weathered and shattered and uh, um, not such a good bond, actually. And actually, the concrete wasn't bonded. It was the joint for a fracture there that's weathered. So it's resting on it and we're seeping through it. It's not tight down to the rock itself. So is this one continuous yes. boring, but just in divided into three yeah. sections in your box? Yes. Hmm. So, and, that, and that's, you know, five foot box, so that's only five, ten, fifteen feet. So that continues in other boxes down to feet vertically. And that gives us an understanding of the joints and fractures. And you can see there, uh, in the second row, for example, on the far right, you can see that inclined or sloping uh, line there, that's a, that's a weathered joint between the rock itself and it's part of the natural ecology of the structure. But some of the joints are fresh and, and intact and other ones are um, weathered and more seeping through them and, and as that water continues over time, you know, it weathers the rock and the rock is softer. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but that's also critical information uh, that we consider if, if for example, grouting or Part of the solution, we need to understand the characteristics of the rock and how pervious and fractured it is because then that relates directly to how one would go about grouting this rock and what type of grouting we would do to switch it together uh, if that were the object. But first steps first, understand the conditions and what they mean and what they mean, and then from there, bring that to the integrity and projected integrity of the project. How much take to get down one of them, of course? Uh, that can vary. Uh, depends on many, many factors. Uh, you know, uh, it can be two to three days. Uh, it can be two days. It can be five days. It, it varies depending on many factors. Uh, and certainly, the, not only the equipment, equipment from time to time breaks down, so that can impact the, the duration of the portal. But if everything were running, you know, without breakdowns and so on and so on, uh, you can do that with this type of rig in about two, two and a half days. How many holes are drilled at this time? Yeah, we've got five locations that were indicated in the testing that contract, generally spaced across the length of the spillway, so we're getting representative conditions along the way. And it's, you, know, you can always use more cores, but this type of is a pretty, you know, it's a couple hundred to four, four hundred, almost five hundred foot long. Uh, the, the bonding or <clears throat> the one picture shows where the concrete meets the rock. Are you finding that in the other holes also? Uh, yes. In one of the locations, the bond was actually pretty good and then very kind of 
hike through the concrete, but in several other locations, it would be in voids. And, and so there was clearly uh, not at least at the four locations the drawing. But this is where I said, so five boards, 20%, you know, representation for each. It at least gives us a kind of an understanding of, well, were all of them good bonds, were only one or two of them bad, it gives us an indication of what's there. But also, uh, we'll be correlating that with the uh, seepage information and other things to help us understand the implications. <coughs> so the data management side of it, uh, we've been talking about the survey methods and the point clouds. What you got there? <coughs> I want to do it earlier. You want to, uh, no. Can you start over then, please? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be glad to if you want. <laughs> um, so this is one of the most important aspects of, of the job, which is that while we've done the surveys and, and gathered this point cloud, this digital information, what we're now doing is, is using that and, and all the benefits of digital technology to look at the rock structure and the characteristics of the rock and the foundation and so on. And on the left is, is again, that, that kind of overview, you can get a sense for the scale of the project. EJ West is on the right edge of the left photo and that's your great bridge all that. On the right photo, uh, a little kind of zoomed in look there, closer in, uh, you can see the spillway uh, to the top right slope um, in the foreground and the gatehouse in the background. But you see these different color panels that are on there and um, they're kind of slices or planes representing the different joints and fractures in the rock and the orientation of them. And we just use color schemes to show uh, different orientations. And if you think back to that half basketball, that, that compass that I showed you earlier, or southeast west, the rock structure occurs in an aspect oriented or an kind of orientation, and we're seeing persistent joint sets that are natural to the rock. <coughs> Actually, if you look at the Adirondacks from satellite photo, you can see what looks like an X, and, and you've got joint sets that run from northeast to southwest, and from northwest to southeast. You can actually see that in the terrain. And, and these are actually the joint sets that are not only consistent with the Adirondack structure, but also there are some that are unique to the site of the geology of that case. So one thing that's uh, important is that when they excavated the Utila Channel, back in the 1930s, drilling and blasting technology was not as defined as it is today, where now they're going to do surgically. Back then, I think it was all about production. And some of the uh, photos, and particularly if you've seen that one that I showed earlier with the uh, view inside the channel before they put the concrete over mm -hmm. it, the rock is very fractured. And the one thing that, in addition to the natural joint sets that you're seeing here, the, uh, we're also seeing the borders of the influence from the drilling and blasting itself. <coughs> Those are kind of a set of fractures that aren't consistent with the rest of the natural rock structure. And, and that's important. You know, so we're looking at both the natural and the, the man-made fractures as well. So before we go there, what I'm going to do is, if I can just for a second here, I'm going to show you an example of the model that we've been working with. <laughs> Yep. 
imagination button. And here you were saying how your technology <laughs> yeah. is so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, this screen is wonderful, and that one not so wonderful. <laughs> if not. I can see it here, it's up there. The uh, unplug and replug. What application is it that you're trying to use? This is just a PDF. Yeah. 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 Just a PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I would bring down the presentation. Yeah, bring down the presentation. Close. So now you're sounding like Spectrum. Where have I heard that before? Yeah. Uh, I'm <laughs> Next step is what? Kick it, right? <laughs> hey, Spectrum. Eight. Is that a PowerPoint? We're going to get no. the screen we're getting. Well, the screen's HD antenna for local. Anyway. Oh, another one. So we get 6, 10, 13. No, I don't get it. Oh, yeah. But I don't know if it's because I'm too far away. How about PDF? And then, uh, what do you do for your other show? Roku? You know, or you just don't watch it? Can we do that? We can smart TV. Can so no. Okay, okay. There you go. Yeah. 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 I think a light off might be better. Uh, this is the image that we've been showing you previously. This is not a photograph. This is a digital point cloud. And we've developed a three-dimensional model to start with the base information and then add to it various layers to uh, capture and present the conditions that we've surveyed and, and are now part of this project in our evaluation. So we're looking at the starting view there. The next layer, as I can add to it, is this surface here, which is part of the concrete that was applied historically as part of the maintenance work, and as Robert was describing, where some of the blocks were getting plucked out and so on. Uh, the concrete was used both as infill material, but also to retain blocks from, uh, from coming out. And next here, uh, there was also another type of material, it was a shot cream that was applied here, and, and this isn't all of the materials. There are some, Robert mentioned some asphalt uh, materials and so on. Uh, but for the most part, these are the two predominant materials here. And the good news is they're there. The bad news is they obscured our view of the rocks, so we weren't able to get rock structure data at those locations. So we had to stitch together information from where the rock was exposed and then present that. What I showed you before in that, uh, that stereo that encompassed the uh, presentation. So, moving on to the next layer, well, we have these, there's a series of joints, and you can see these plates or planes. They kind of represent the alignment of the joints in the rock. And, and this one might be familiar to you. If you've ever stood on the uh, embankment dam and looked back across towards the project, you, there's this prominent vertical almost like perfectly vertical, smooth face, like a wall almost, and then that's a representation of that condition. But we also see that throughout the project. Let's get to move on to some other ones before I show you some more detail. Uh, so now this is adding joint sets that are cutting across instead of being parallel to the face, being the ones that cut across. And we see these, and this is what I was saying earlier, that you know the original mountainside came straight down and across, and they excavated down into the mountain. So the joint sets that are over on this side and that you can see from the spillway when you look across uh, are also shown. That's the uh, where uh, they went across section uh, at the spillway.
the way channels are 50 feet deep, well, if the joints continue down below that, and they do, uh, they're actually connected, and it's kind of like a garden hose. So no matter what the hose does in between, it doesn't matter. It's split into two ends, you know, so you've got a high end and a low end. What if this is the Collectively, with these different joint sets, they come together, and where they do come together physically, uh, that's where wedges and blocks can develop, and those are the blocks that Robert was referring to. Where they don't intersect, uh, you're, it's really the strength of the rock, and it's kind of like you know, trying to tear a piece of wood in half a can. Uh, whereas if there's a bunch of layers to it, that's where they can move. So that's why we look at the joints. All joint sets. So this is the west, here's the spillway, the greenhouse. <coughs> these are all of the different joint sets that we've got captured in that. What I can do here is just the distance, uh, turn and then adjust the model, and you can start to see where things are occurring. So that's a bird's eye view, for example. You can look at it from underneath, and, and these are the things that become very powerful. And we haven't fully developed this yet, but this is part of the evaluation, um, particularly when you're considering stability or grouting programs and things. Uh, this information, when you're able to look at it spatially and from underneath and so on, you can really start to understand where the influence of grouting, for example, would, how far it would reach and where it would go. Yes, it'll follow the open joints and fractures where grouting, where grouting is meaningful, and also where not to grout. Uh, because there's some places where, while you can pump grouting into the joints and fractures, if there isn't a stability concern or the rock isn't at risk in those locations, uh, unless we're concerned about seepage, um, grouting wouldn't necessarily be, you know, fruit of the I mean, why you want to spend money there if you don't need to. Kind of so having this technology really allows us to look at the project in very different views and views that aren't normally intuitive, but we can see where the joints and fractures are in relation to uh, the surfaces and features. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Uh, I know that's a lot boiled down pretty quickly, but I wanted to give you a snapshot of Very good. Uh, Very good. Original Very excellent. And where we are in the project and, and where we're progressing. Is that proprietary software of yours? Or? <laughs> well, that's okay. I'm, no, 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 is it yours or is it something you guys have developed in other words? It's a blend of things that we've done with other people's software and we do our own uh, additions to it. So it's, it's somewhat, yeah, I think pretty cool. Uh, I'm not sure we have patents here or elsewhere, but we use it on our projects and uh, it's, it's an enormously powerful tool. Yeah. This is just a PDF, free PDF. Yeah, this isn't the real model. That we've populated in the background with the data. So, but it's very, it's a way that any computer can <coughs> use the data. This also may help you as you get into, and one of the ways that we use this ultimately is when we look at, it's one thing to review and understand the conditions and how they relate to the integrity or the business of the project. The next thing is, okay, well, what do we do about those conditions? And are they concerned or not? And if they are concerned, what should they look like? And then we use the same model to present what those types of solutions are, and it can be a very helpful tool in not only communicating what we found and what the types of repairs need to be or were recommended, but also uh, it can help the board in its own discussions uh, and understanding the issues and what the impact of them. So it's, it's used throughout the project. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was awesome. That was very nice. Thanks for your interest. Not everyone will see us. And so thank you. No, it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. Do you mind if we escape? Yes. <laughs> no? I got the escape button. <laughs> um, if you, can you just press the uh, on button, off button until the light blinks and it will shut itself off. This was the riveting part of our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why you were required to stay. Yeah. <laughs>
It may not blink. I think it's the, the uh, bulb is off, so you should be all set. Okay. Just to cool that over. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you again. And thank you. Awesome. You know, sometimes questions pop up, obviously, through Robert. Or if you have questions, we'd be glad to answer. Right. Thank you for the status of the Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank Are you ready to you proceed? Thanks for having us. Have a safe trip, Hello. gentlemen. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm sure the guy in the yeah. field, you know, with the with the wind blowing hard, has <laughs> a different view of it necessarily. <laughs> see the fruit of the labor, right? I'm not loving it. Unfortunately, this is fascinating. They were really good. They were good. Did we do the? Yes, start, um, started roll call. Yes, I'm doing it. Yes, I, I, I apologize for my... Uh, yes. Don't worry about it. We're docking your pay. <laughs> We're docking your pay. <laughs> You're only going to make half of what we normally do. Right. Mm-hmm. We're taking your bonus away. <laughs> Are you uh, set? Oh, again. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Let me know when I can start. Okay, uh, we're going back to number three. Uh, just for our roll call. Mark Finkel. Here. Albert Hayes. Here. Jeffrey Rosenberg. Here. Ken DeWitt. Here. Robert Leslie. Here. Charles Bolton. Here. Don Hines. Stephanie Rizicki. Here. Richard Farr. Here. Thank you. Motion uh, to adapt the uh, meeting agenda. Jeff, just sort of. Make that motion. Jeff, make that. Had, Jeff had a motion out there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wait for a second. Yeah, I'll second that. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, so we want to do a uh, moment of. Uh, a well, I did it. I just wanted to. Okay. You know, mention. Yeah. Thank our veterans who serve our country. Um, motion to approve the uh, October 10th minutes. Uh, I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion or corrections? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, report of the executive director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My report starts on page six. I apologize in advance. I've got a cough I can't get rid of. I'm going to try to make it through the best I can. Um, <clears throat> attended the Great Second Battle Lake Action Committee meeting in Edinburgh. Um, as you know, the, the, well, maybe you don't know, the chamber has had some changes down there with personnel. Uh, the one person we reported to, uh, Venetia Lannon, has left. And there's several other people in the chamber that have departed. Uh, let's see. The chief engineer, uh, Rob, wrote an article explaining the water levels. Uh, Jeff, you were talking about that back in in a couple meetings in the Great Sack and Dog Lake and Stillwater Reservoir. And I commend, I read it, it's, it's excellent, short, concise, Good. and if people were to read it, it explains rather than foolish Thank questions you. that people, you know, ask the board members, why didn't you keep the lake up, why is it, I mean, it's wonderful. So we got it on our website. Perfect. Uh, it's, it'll be in our next newsletter. In the annual letter that goes out with the renewal, there'll be a link so people can catch that up. Catch up on that. Uh, the fall issue of the Regulating District newsletter was sent out via <coughs> email this past October. This, this issue reached more subscribers than ever with uh, over 2,000 people opening a quarterly publication. So we got a lot of hits. Yeah. The roof project at Second Dog Field Office. Um, we received uh, some documents we we're waiting for. Uh, Rob and Rob will do the final review and uh, I will sign it. Then it'll go to OGS and AG's office. Uh, OSC. 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 I'm sorry. OSC. I put you. OSC. And uh, seeing. I think it's kind of late in the year. We don't plan on awarding the contract till the spring of 2019. There's, as you can tell, we've got snow and everything now, so <laughs> it's not a good time to put a roof on. <coughs> so we're going to hold off on that. The and water's up, though. The water's up. 
Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that completes my PD report. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Today. Any questions? Comments? Thank you very much. Uh, contracts. First one, board authorization to procure engineering services for completion of fourth independent consultant safety inspection for the Great Sacramento Lake Project. Mr. Colby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my memo is on page seven, I believe. Uh, it's been four years since we completed the third part 12. We have complete independent consultant inspections every five years for our FERC. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission regulated projects. Conklinville's is due uh, coming up in February of 2020. And so uh, staff seeks board authorization to procure engineering services from a qualified engineering firm to complete the fourth part 12 independent consultant safety inspection report for Conklinville Dam. How do, how do they connect? How the Schnabel uh, and then how do they connect, if at all, with one another? Well, in this particular case, um, the, the work that Schnabel is, is performing uh, comes out of our desire to extend the life of the project, uh, more so than it does uh, come from a non-compliance concern or issue. Uh, but, that being said, uh, and at Stillwater, for example, or I'm sure many other projects, the independent consultant inspection uh, it includes sufficient enough analysis to identify areas of concern, typically. And that um, those recommendations or the concerns of the independent consultant are usually something we follow up on if there are any uh, in terms of analysis, and then uh, even further, if there's a need to remediate the, the site. Um, still water is, is a much so better example of there's a finding. But would it be accurate there's information that will come out of this that then Schnabel can use in its effort? Um, well, actually, the, the other way around. A lot of the information that, that Schnabel has gathered for us in the process of remediating the spillway and, and its foundation um, will be useful to the independent consultant. Okay. Um, certainly not all of the study will be done, uh, Schnabel study will be done in time for the independent consultant to include it in, in their report, um, but certainly what they've gathered thus far would be reviewed. Um, and if there's information in, you know, that's been gathered as a result of the investigations that um, leads to new recommendations by that independent consultant that he or she would put that in their report. So, yeah. They are connected to some extent, though, in terms of uh, identifying problems and then um, solving them. Yeah. Cool. So there's no... Just a motion, I believe, is yeah. all that is necessary for this. Yeah. I'll make that motion. I'll second that. Um, any further discussion, questions? All in favor? Aye. 80 opposed. Second contract. Resolution to approve amendment number four to contract C022012 to include tasks two, three, and four related to the SSPMP, whatever that is. Yeah, the site specific probable maximum precipitation uh, analysis oh, at Stillwater Dam. Um, back. Uh, I believe it was, in, uh, in, well, I guess it was beginning of this year. Um, the board did authorize uh, the completion of a uh, site specific analysis, mm -hmm. and the first portion of that site specific analysis included a feasibility study. Um, and that a study was attached to my memorandum. It, um, it was a, a, a precursor to the full site-specific probable maximum precipitation analysis, which um, would give us an idea 
of the merits and benefit of completing a much larger, more extensive uh, study, um, actually a significantly more costly study. And the process that the um, consultant works through is to take the factors and conditions that have been observed in similar studies in the region and apply them uh, generally to our site and see what the results would be if we were to move through a full study and calculate the site-specific parameters, the site-specific conditions and uh, and then apply them to our site-specific precipitation events. Um, and their report indicated that uh, if we were to move forward with a full site-specific analysis that uh, we could see a potential for a reduction in the probable maximum precipitation at Stillwater Dam uh, of about 27%. That's beneficial uh, because it means we should see a reduced amount of flow associated with the uh, design flood for that project and if it's lower uh, flow we have lower water surface elevation and that benefits us in terms of the loads that are on the project facilities structures um, which help to keep our facility structures uh, in the range of acceptable stability uh, and, and um, uh, you know, um, factors of safety um, remain acceptable as compared to the alternative, which is if the you know, uh, flood were higher, uh, the, if the water elevation was higher, then we would be facing potential uh, increase in those loads and the potential for uh, the factors of safety not to be to meet the uh, the acceptable ranges for the, the various structures. Um, the original intent was to move forward if we, after having completed the feasibility study and after and if we had found that there was a potential uh, significant reduction, meaningful reduction, to move forward with the full site specific analysis. But in the course of um, engineering staff's discussion with our consultant, HDR um, and, and with a suggestion that we, or a question more so, that we uh, possibly look at applying some of the factors that one would apply during the full site specific analysis to our current probable maximum precipitation analysis, would there be a benefit? And could, could we actually do that? And at first uh, blush, the consultant uh, had indicated, no, it would take nearly the same amount of time and require the same amount of effort as the full site specific analysis. Uh, about two weeks later, uh, about a week and week ago, uh, in a discussion with our consultant, uh, we found out that uh, another branch of their engineering firm working on a very similar approach with um, somewhat uh, favorable response from FERC and uh, the potential is there for us to be able to make a sizable reduction in our probable maximum precipitation estimate and then thus the, the design flood for Stillwater without moving into the site specific analysis at all and uh, so I, I think it's, it's well worth uh, the uh, quote was for an additional $28,500 to, uh, to move forward uh, having HDR take a look at and make this uh, alternate method, as I refer to it as an alternate methodology to reduce the current FERC accepted probable maximum precipitation value. Uh, <clears throat> before and uh, hopefully uh, eliminate the need to move forward with the, the uh, significantly more expensive, almost a full uh, order of magnitude, more expensive uh, study. And uh, so the staff recommends accepting the, 
acceptance of HDR's proposal for the completion of uh, what we're referring to as Task 1A uh, and seeks board authorization to amend the contract scope of work and fee to include Task 1A uh, and authorization for the interim executive director to execute an amendment to the agreement to increase the contract pr price by $28,500 to a total of 87,250. And I'll be happy to go into any more detail on any aspect of that or two important questions. Yeah. Uh, within reasonable engineering expertise, mm -hmm. are you satisfied that it's adequate? And part B of that question, are you within reasonable certainty okay that FERC will ultimately accept it? Uh, well, we, we won't know whether FERC will accept it uh, until we make the presentation and we back that up with some engineering. But FERC, FERC will not. They're entertaining it right now, okay. and, and um, I really don't – if, if the, the methodology is almost exactly the same as what they use for the site-specific analysis. That methodology has been accepted by FERC for a site-specific okay. analysis. Um, but it really boils down to, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable because the approach is exactly the same. Um, it's just for some reason it hasn't been the, the you know, the, the method for used to date, I guess, approach used to date. Um, but, uh, but the engineering and the analysis is exactly the same. It's, um, what it really boils down to is, is the the current uh, probable maximum precipitation event um, or storm that's applied to Stillwater Dam is a generalized um, uh, based uh, event. It takes all the storms that occur all throughout the year and uh, applies it in a general sense and in a general way to our specific watershed. The so site-specific analysis looks at specific storms on our watershed and and how they uh, affect the watershed. <coughs> what this alternate methodology does is take the generalized storms, pare it down, basically we'll pare it down to the specific storms uh, and in the same way as the site-specific analysis does, uh, <coughs> but without that additional series of analysis. Okay. We're using the existing data and, uh, and applying the same discount factors uh, and, and, and uh, parameters that uh, can be applied in the site-specific analysis to the current analysis. So um, I, it's, I think it's, it's very promising approach. Um, I expect us to be able to get some uh, appreciable reduction in the probable maximum precipitation uh, as a result of it. So, and hopefully um, set the stage and when we go forward. Exactly. Maximum. Exactly. I mean, and that, that, is, that is the reason we're, we're, we're spending the time on this is that uh, <coughs> the alternative is to be faced with a, a higher uh, flood event than was calculated some 20 or 30 years ago, um, and the uh, and you know corresponding higher water surface elevation, which uh, you know can affect the, and will affect the stability of the calculations and of the other structures. So by lowering the precipitation, we lower that headwater elevation and hopefully uh, maintain our, uh, ex you know, the, the uh, factors of safety which are accept currently acceptable. Very good. Well, that was fun. Well, this is on a whole thing. Yeah. Engineering. Teaching us <laughs> non-engineering. Well, so we need a resolution <laughs> to approve the amendment. Yes. Yeah. I'll make that motion. And I'll second. Please. Please. Any further discussion? No. And all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And I like the list of acronyms. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, I, I said to Mr. Yeah. Coltan, you know, when they pick on lawyers for acronyms, 
This beats them all. <laughs> uh, staff and committee reports, general counsel, Mr. Leslie. Uh, I have a report in here as well. I have no idea what page it's on. Thank you. Uh, the council for uh, Carthage Specialty Paper Board uh, who filed a uh, file bankruptcy uh, gave us a call, told us or I gave them a call. Checked and they the basically mail. told us that the check's in the mail. We <coughs> have actually received that check. Ooh. Uh, so Carthage is up to date on their 2017-18 uh, beneficiary assessment and their 2018-19 beneficiary assessment. I've let uh, Lauren and Kim know the new uh, address for the buyer out of that bankruptcy uh, so that the assessments going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was good news. Uh, marching on McDonald's bill, uh, I'm going to cover it as of Friday, uh, had not been delivered. Uh, I doubt that it's been delivered this morning. Um, but uh, I expect that before the end of the year, and I expect that the governor will probably uh, not sign it into law. Um, Will veto. Will veto. For, for clarification, if we sits on it, well, that's true. It becomes law. That is true. Uh, <coughs> I, I expect he'll veto. Um, that pretty much said. I offered uh, executive director and board chair advice and council on personnel issues. We had a couple of FOIA requests that came in this week after the report was written and before the board meeting. Those have been addressed. Nothing. Of no, really. Any questions? Sir? Thank you, Mr. Leslie. Thank you very much. Uh, compliance officer, Mr. Pickey. Thank you. My report can be found on page 83. As I remind you, each uh, board meeting on 845, you can find the contract status sheet. Please take time to review those. Your uh, review of them at each meeting satisfies our annual public authority requirement. Under the Minority Women Business and Curtis is able to own business administration program, all of our reports have been submitted as required. Uh, the only thing I want to mention is last month we had uh, Mr. Rosenthal as the online payment system for our after permit. Mm -hmm. And to reach out to Beth at IMC, she's our database and web based um, programmer. And I also reached out to Elevon. They have the contract for state agencies. Elevon is going to provide our um, <coughs> provider with the software they use. Beth uses authorized.net. Uh, the state uses Converge. So she's going to have to take a look at that payment platform and develop that for us to use. She did provide me with a quote. Um, we want to do a simple payment form. She can set it up for $1425. If you want the extra identification information, then cost us $1,900 for her on her side to set the page. Uh, and on the state side, um, transactional, right? transactional, like um, 25 cents per transaction. And oh, the, the permittee will be charged? No, the cost no. will come back to us. We'll That's what I thought. Right. The way the state has so we'll have to use the 25 cents per charge. Then there's going to be a uh, percentage based on what the actual fee is. And then there'll be thirty-five dollars a month for rent, plus the rental of the equipment we use. Should someone want to come in and put their report at the counter, Elevon is going to develop a demo software program to share with IMP, so you can see how how to set that up. And then we just have to provide Elevon with um, what we think the number of transactions is going to be and what the cost is going to be. Okay. Time frame. Uh, they didn't give me one in 10 when we want to roll it. The permit renewals have already been permitted, printed for this year, so we can have it for next year, but it's not going to happen this year. So one of the identifying features was maybe putting a code on each person. When did we start this project? And, and I'm, well, I mean, it was the concept. Well, I'm disappointed, that, I'm disappointed, frankly, as a board member, that this is where we are at this stage. It, it should have been implemented by now, and I want the record to speak to that. Well, the, the state, the state was driving you know, the car here. We have, we can't tell the state to give us the authority to transact credit card 
business. They, they give us that. When did that request come? And that was over two years ago. And when did we get authorized? Um, I would say late last summer. Last summer? Correct. Summer of 2017. No, it was in October, because in October I was submitting the DOB. Okay, yeah. so, for, yeah. so for, yeah. we're waiting 12 months for a very simple initiative to enable people mm -hmm. an easy way to pay for their permits. Mm -hmm. And what it sounds like is a couple of phone calls gets the ball rolling. Right, so now that's the development software. When I get back, I can answer how much time she needs. In the meantime, I'm working with her to get our database system <coughs> up to run because as it stands right now, we can't even print renewals. Right. So if we, if we can't print our renewals, yeah. that's a bigger issue. Right. The security around how this will happen has not been determined. So the basic transaction is not complicated, the actual transaction. Right. But the security in the way that the permit key will actually use <coughs> that web-based system mm -hmm. to actually only be able to access their own permit mm -hmm. has not been determined. So this is going to be a series of tests to figure out how that will work. We have to make it simple. Well, again, I submit that my background, having done this for the state in the late 90s and the early 2000s, mm -hmm. other agencies have been up and running with online permitting and payment. That was one of the roadblocks also. We, we were told early on that we would not be allowed to do our own transacting and that we would have to piggyback on another larger agency. They pointed to DEC, right. they pointed to, and that in fact didn't come out. That, that did not pan out. And we went right back to the drawing board to have to do it on our own. So they jerked us around a little bit. I, I, actually, my, my thought was we want to do this on our own. They were the ones who came right back to us and said, there's existing transactional platforms. We don't want to reinvent the wheel so much. I think it was that they just don't want to. Uh, they would rather not add an additional agency to perform that kind of transactional process. So, well, again, there are a whole number of agencies, in fact, that have piggybacked on the state's model. Yeah, and we know what they are. I mean, to do your registration and to whatever it is. license. I mean, right. I mean, the Department of Motor Vehicles has had this. You renew your right. license right. online. Right. I, I hear you. But there's some natural, already built-in securities around the way that system works, which, again, I think was one of the reasons why we were not going to piggyback on that system. So you know, we, have, we have to come up with our own. And we have our own standalone software system, the permit system. How many event. permit holders are there? Uh, over 4,700. 4, so we're dragging our feet for 4,700 people. And how many people have driver's licenses? That's a rhetorical question. And registrations. I'd like to see this move, mm -hmm. and I would like specific answers by next month's meeting. I want a time frame when this is going to occur. I'm very disappointed. I asked for this since I've been on the board. Since I've been on the board, and that's I'm going into my third year, so three years for a very simple application to get into the 21st century. <clears throat> okay, any other questions or comments? Um, keep the thought for our Mr. Chairman, my report, uh, I'll focus on my report, which begins on page 86. Uh, we are still waiting for the final uh, audit statements, which I expect to present to the board at the December 11th meeting. Uh, monthly financial forecast, cash flow reports are on <coughs> page 8, page uh, 110. On 108 is the current year. Uh, if you look at November, you can see down at the bottom that that will be our high water mark for funds. In the respect of civic tax, it really gets us to over six million twelve hundred thousand dollars. As far as assessments go, we did receive since this report was pressure provided to the board, we did receive all the needs uh, assessments in the amount of one million thirty-four thousand five hundred sixty-nine dollars, leaving Rensselaer County. Uh, 
there's the 542,379. This is the first year that uh, they were required to provide their assessment by uh, October 31st. Refresh the board's memory uh, up through last June. Uh, the consent agreement provided that they uh, would be able to pass in January. I believe they may still be in that mindset, so I'll reach out to them. Uh, certainly not a cash flow issue, but we'd like to receive more assessments during the same month. Uh, all of the upon receipt of the Albany Engineering uh, 10F federal FERC uh, fees, that brings all of the FERC uh, fees to date. On the Black River side, we've received all of the Hydro fees other than uh, hydro development. We received all of the hydro fees on the, on the Black River side except hydro development, and that's 11869 So we received well over 800, and uh, I think we're more like 840 something thousand. We're actually uh, 837,000. As far as the county, we received all the county except Jefferson. Uh, that's 30,336 and we'll give them a call if uh, their assessment is delayed. Just a couple things on the IT side. Uh, the whole district-wide internet ban and upgrade has been completed. Uh, you got transferred the firewall management from Spectrum to TAG. Uh, that's a good thing. You got a much cheaper price. Uh, TAG is already providing the other network support, so it makes sense we don't have to get Spectrum and TAG talking to each other when we have issues. And uh, we did Spectrum uh, installed additional new modem, an additional new modem at Mayfield, which corrected uh, the final issue we had with the voice over IP phone system where we were getting computer uh, and other things as well. People were calling up. Uh, that's my report. Any questions? Any uh, questions? Thank you very much, sir. Um, uh, Chief Engineer, Mr. Colson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The report begins on page 112. Um, through writing of my report, uh, <coughs> the 23rd of October, Precipitation in the Hudson River area, about 65% of historic average, uh, with uh, inflow to Great Sacandaga Lake at about 95, or excuse me, 94% of historic average, and uh, Indian Lake about 58% of historic average. Again, at the writing of the report, uh, Great Sacandaga Lake was right at or slightly above our target elevation and target uh, and following the target curve uh, till about the beginning Sorry. of November till about the beginning of November uh, and, and uh, since about the beginning of November uh, our precipitation has picked up significantly uh, and uh, we are now about uh, six feet above the target elevation at Great Sacandaga Lake we had our, our peak inflow since November 1st uh, occurred on the 6th of November. with over 10,700 CFS come into the reservoir that day. Um, maybe needless to say, but I will obviously repeat it just so that um, uh, you know it's, it's, it's clear. The releases are currently being limited by the amount of water that's in the Hudson River. Uh, the offer of settlement. Uh, prescribes exactly how much can be released uh, every day of the year based on the natural flow as measured at Hadley in the Hudson and uh, it's driven also by the elevation of the reservoir and uh, our releases are maximizing uh, the, the room that we're given in the offer of settlement every day. Um, we've actually had to cut back wishful thinking on my part on a few days in the last week, but, um, you know, scheduled uh, more release than I was allowed to and had to cut those back. 
Um, but but um, that being said, and even though the forecast is is good for only three to five days out, uh, temperatures are going to supposed to be become significantly colder over the next week or so, which should begin to uh, you know lock up some of that water that's running off into the reservoir. Um, which is good news. Not necessarily the reservoir locking up in ice, but at least the inflow should uh, drop off um, a bit over the next week or so. And uh, we're already seeing some of that in the, in the natural flow in the Hudson. Um, I expect, again, as, as the forecast allows me right now, for the next two or three days, I uh, expect to be able to uh, begin releasing uh, 4,000 CFS, which is the maximum we can release this time of the year based on our elevation uh, out of Great Sock and Dogan Lake. And that should uh, start to bring the reservoir down um, slowly at first, but if it stays cold, obviously, and, the, and we don't get significantly more liquid precipitation, we should make some decent headway on it. For the next few days, the reservoir, I, I anticipate it staying fairly close to where it is right now. Um, and not, not rising an awful lot, but it is going to come up, you know, t tenths of a foot um, and, and not feet <laughs> over the next uh, three or four days. And then we should see a, a, a turnaround in the elevation. Mm -hmm. so, uh, in, the, in the Black River area, we had uh, a little bit... Uh, A little bit more precipitation um, that helped us recover our elevation that has still water uh, to some extent, even now, um, and with the precip that we received in the Stillwater Reservoir watershed since uh, the writing of my report, still water has come up to um, just now seven tenths of a foot above the historic average. So we've recovered everything that we were, uh, you know, the deficit that we, we maintained throughout most of the summer, um, which is good in terms of reservoir operation and preparing us for being able to augment uh, appropriately throughout the drier winter months. Um, again, there, we're, we're making releases, but those are to some extent limited based on the flow that occurs uh, as measured uh, on the Beaver River at Krogan, as well as um, in the Black River at Watertown, um, and, so, and and also uh, not wanting to you know, be too aggressive in terms of the release of that water, given how dry it was over the over the summer. So, um, our small reservoirs were making releases, uh, Six Lake and Old Forge. Um, <coughs> They were also affected by the rain that fell in November. Um, they're above target elevation, uh, six like by a 1.3 feet. Old Forge, not, not as, as bad, only up six tenths of a foot above our target elevation at, at that location. Um, but we're making releases and those reservoirs are coming down. So I expect them, even despite the more recent precip, to be able to bring those back down to target in the next uh, few weeks. Any questions? I'd be happy to answer. Robert, is, is the, the website uh, the uh, height of the water? Is that uh, correct? Uh, it looks it, like it's just going down. It, it, which which page in particular do you know um, which you're referring to? Um, I've got it. Is it the... Uh, Is the USGS uh, yes. site or water data? Yeah. USGS. And, and and what in particular about that? Close. So I haven't. I mean, I review it every day. I haven't seen. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is that the one? I mean, it. it you know, it, there, it just keeps there's going a, down. Well, there is a target elevation on there yeah. and mm -hmm. an envelope of um, the actual. It's pretty good. 
Right. It's above the settlement. Yeah. Right, right. It, we came back up above the settlement uh, about the end of, I believe it was the end of you know, said, October. I thought, I thought it would be going up a little bit more. Uh, a of well, it, since, November. since November, it's come up. Um, Come up three feet since first of November. Thereabouts. Uh, November first, we were at seven fifty nine point eight, and we're uh, we're now at uh, seven sixty three point two. So. I see uh, people's posts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There. A little bit more, but the work back <laughs> there, there are always some docs out there. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. My, 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 it, it was nice for me because as the water came up, I was able to pull my docks in. It does and help. So Sometimes. when the water goes down, when the ice comes in, they won't touch my docks. Yeah, <laughs> the timing has to be perfect. I have to check my dock today. I'll be in business. Sorry. <laughs> Listen, it is what it is. That concludes my report. There are no further questions. Um, okay, uh, back to your report. Yes, uh, so board expenses? Yes, board expenses. On page 111, I can ask the board to make a motion to approve board expenses in the amount of $775.50. Yeah, I'll make that motion. I'll second that motion. Um, any further discussion? No. All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Can you close? Thank you. Go back to that. Uh, Area Administrator, Mr. Hodgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> My report starts on page 142. Well, we've uh, leased an excavator and we have started rip wrap around the lake. Uh, to date, we probably have done about a thousand feet of shoreline so far. Um, staff has attended our annual dam safety surveillance monitoring and training in both areas. And now we're gearing up for the mailing of the uh, annual permit renewals. So they'll be going out the first week of January. And the other thing I have, uh, I should have mentioned it in the ED report, but um, we have been directed by uh, well, my contact on the second floor to put together a Continuity of Operations Plan, COOP, by the end of the year. Uh, Rick, Rob, Fulton, and Stephanie will be going to a training seminar in December. Third and fourth. Third and fourth, thank you. And what is a continuity? <laughs> well, it's, it's... I mean, essentially, it's basically the effort that uh, to ensure that our primary functions continue on following some kind of event. Firehouse burns down. How does the fire department continue to fight fires within 12 hours of the event? The lake is pretty full. So we're working on that and trying to do our best to reach that deadline. It's, um, it's a pretty complex get together there to get everything in place. Uh, we reached out to a couple other agencies looking for a template from them to uh, hopefully assist us in putting our plan together a little bit more quickly. Okay. okay. So that is in the works. And um, we have submitted to the second floor a list of potential board members and prioritized. So that's up there. Okay. We hope to hear something shortly, but uh, keep our fingers crossed. That uh, concludes my report. I'll be glad to hear any questions. Any questions? Any comments? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, any other board member questions and comments? Okay, resolution for the next board meeting, which is 12 11 in Lake George. Any resolution for that meeting? Yeah, I'll make that resolution. I'll second it. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you.